Humanity is a time of reckoning. Reckoning is the facing of oneself and all of one's creations, and that everything that's been claimed and created in fear needs to be reseen or reclaimed in a higher way. Nothing is reclaimed until it's first accepted. The octave, the common field that we all share and occupy, is informed by fear in such a way that we don't even really recognize it. It's just present. It's like swimming in a dirty swimming pool. It's all we've known, so we just don't know the difference. This is the interesting spot because it can't be a fight, but also mm -hmm. there's tension between yeah. the one who's trying to bring the illumination, because of their agreements to fear, resistant mm -hmm. to the illumination. The idea of being a warrior concerns me sometimes because a warrior needs a battle and needs a war. And I think that things can be transformed in other ways, that the only problem that humanity really has is what they call the denial of the divine. The kingdom is here, but the kingdom is a perception. It's a perception from a different octave. Who's running the show? Who sits in the throne? And they say the personality has its place, but our confusion is we think it's the king. You know, we think that the vote structure is running everything, and it need not. Paul, it's good to see you again, brother. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, for sure. So as we're exploring this text from largely the Book of Innocence and wherever else it might go, uh -huh. what in your mind is the direction that the guides took the teachings in Book of Innocence that included and transcended the other teachings that they've taught prior? You know, I don't know. They just finished another one. You know, the 12th book was just completed <laughs> about two weeks ago. And so my brain is sort of swimming from all of this. And there's a point when they all sort of come together as one. I think what's really happened in the teachings is they've taken us away from a kind of sense of self-importance to a sense of collective awareness. And a lot of what they're working with now is this idea of moving beyond collective restriction. And most of these things seem to be held in memory. So where they went to in this book, which was very different and unexpected, was that the idea that everything that we see and experience in most ways has been named by those who came before us. And every memory mm -hmm. that we hold individually and collectively is tainted by what they say is a false belief in separation. So our memory is actually faulty, and they're dealing with a restoration to the aspect of each of us that they say is innocence, is the true innocent. And not innocent as in stupid, but innocent as in uncorrupted, untainted, known without fear. So they've said for a long time that the octave, the common field that we all share and occupy is informed by fear in such a way that we don't even really recognize it. It's just present. It's like swimming in a, in a dirty swimming pool. It's all we've known, so we just don't know the difference. And the idea of moving to what they call the upper room and reclaiming ourselves, or being reclaimed might be a better way to say it, at this level of tone or resonance claims a world anew, because the world that we see isn't informed by the old and consequently can be lifted or reclaimed at this level of tone or resonance, which does not hold the old template. So if you can imagine just shifting beyond a whole system of agreement and what things were supposed to mean, who we're supposed to be and how we thought the world was to a very different way, I think that's where they're taking us now. Yeah, really what I feel when I'm reading reading the words from the guides and, and just feeling it in my own body. And, and that's one of the reasons why we came together is that what the guides are saying are things that feel true, anthro-ontologically, mm -hmm. anthropos, my body, ontologically, that which is real. Mm -hmm. I feel it in my body. Yeah. And this idea that the kingdom is here, but the kingdom is a perception. It's a, perce mm -hmm. it's a perception from a different octave. And yeah. actually all things are the kingdom if you can see it from that, from that octave. Yeah. And it's the interesting parts are, is then you can't all, you can't one deny the divine that is in, mm -hmm. as, and through all things. You can't deny the divine, but you also mm -hmm. can't bypass yeah. the actual strata of density 
that yeah. things are happening where yeah. moves are being made, control and fear and all of these different things are being proliferated from. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting place that the guides are inviting. They're inviting us to. Mm -hmm. And and I feel this invitation personally. And I feel, you know, incredibly grace, like incredibly grateful that I've been able to actually find myself on the bridge to be able to see through, you know, the upper room and then mm -hmm. also take action in the level of density from the site that I've been able to gain from mm -hmm. the upper room. But it's, it's, it requires us to be able to see all of the different octaves and, and then, and then be able to navigate how, what we should do and how we should mm -hmm. interact with the world. I agree. I mean, you know, they said in the very first book, which was dictated in 2009 and published in 2010, and this is the 11th, um, that humanity is a time of reckoning. And then they broke that down and said a reckoning is a facing of oneself and all of one's creations. And that everything that's been claimed and created in fear needs to be reseen or reclaimed in a higher way. And I don't think that we get to do that unless we're willing to bear witness to it. You know, it's not about accusation and blame as much as recognition. Because mm -hmm. the guides have said again and again and again, you can't lift with well, it. You say you can't lift the evil man to the upper room because you've aligned to him at that level of tone or consciousness or equivalency. But that doesn't deny the acts of one or the collective choices that we've made. I think we like to think that we're not party to what we see because it's happening elsewhere or through somebody else's experience. But the guides have actually said that if you can see it, you're in alignment to it and the consciousness that you hold is actually informing it at whatever level you come to it with. So if you're coming to it, as you said, from the higher perspective, you can actually lift it or reclaim it at its essence, which is of source. You know, they mm -hmm. say you know, who you put in darkness, what you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. They've said it for years and it's a simple teaching, but it's a teaching of alignment. You go to the higher where you're not reinforcing the negative but you can see what is there and you can understand it and you can also lift it this doesn't mean you're i doesn't mean you're not in discernment i think it means you're in high discernment but i mm -hmm. think the aspect of you that's perceiving is the one that's perceiving without the agenda that the personality structure probably has right there's a there's a quote um, from the book and it's you cannot fight the darkness you can bring the light to the darkness but illumination is never a battle yeah. and it's a beautiful and beautiful and, and pure and clean teaching as as always the guides you know they deliver with a sense of impeccability but there's there's a nuance to that because in certain cases the illumination may be resisted yeah. one resisted and two the illumination may be necessary. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is the interesting spot because again, yes, it can't be a fight, but mm -hmm. also there's a um there's tension between yeah. the one who's trying to bring the illumination and the one who is resistant to in, because of their agreements to fear, resistant mm -hmm. to the illumination, their agreements to separation, resistant to the illumination. So it does create a certain sense mm -hmm. of tex of tension, which could mm -hmm. be perceived as a fight. But I think it's it's subtle what the guides are saying. Or productive, possibly too. You know, I mean, if you if you shine a light on something that's been held in darkness for a very, very long time, first of all, the thing doesn't know what to do. It wants to scamper. I mean, go down to your basement and, you know, look at the little bugs that <laughs> turn the lights on. They're all scurrying away from, from the light. And I think nothing is reclaimed until it's first accepted. If the intention is to judge and make wrong, then you have to look at what the motive is. Because I think the idea of illumination is simply, well, it goes back to this quote of the guides, which threw me for a long time, but I sort of get it now. They said, in truth, a lie cannot be held. So in the vibration of truth, the distortion doesn't exist. At the mm -hmm. level of innocence that they're teaching now, which is truth, I guess it's another way to say that, the agendas of the personality self at whatever level have to be reclaimed and renown as well. You know, you don't get to so say you can't be the light and hold another in darkness. It's really simple. And so the light itself may be challenging and 
frightening to one who hasn't seen it. You know, they said once in one of the books, maybe this one, that if somebody has been really reared in darkness, I mean, imagine someone who's lived their whole life in, in, in shadow and in darkness, it's extraordinarily challenging to be mm-hmm. called for, to be witnessed in a higher way. You know, when the guides do workshops and they have people work with each other and they're seeing the inherent divinity in the ones before them or the people are doing it with partners, some people can't do it. It's too painful to be mm-hmm. seen with love. It's too hard. They haven't known it. And it's amazing when it happens, you know, right. everything can change very quickly then. Right. There, what I'm curious about is I understand the teaching God is, God is, God is. Yeah. And then, and even in the unknown and everywhere you look, God is there. There's not mm-hmm. a place where you look where God isn't, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's an aspect of it. Then there are what appear to be forces who are intent that are intentionally and these forces could be embodied or um, but i'm particularly interested in the non-embodied versions of these forces Mm -hmm. forces that are seeming to be intentionally creating more separation intentionally Mm -hmm. creating a denial of the divine intentionally Mm -hmm. trying to debase and kind of demoralize our Mm -hmm. understanding of our truth and our and corrupt our innocence in a certain way Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. What is, you know, maybe you or the guides, like what is, what are the thoughts about these darker forces that are working against our recognition of who we really are, what we are, how we serve, because there is an antagonist, seemingly antagonistic force. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there's also another way that you could look at it from the highest, highest perspective where Mm -hmm. the darkness serves the light. Mm-hmm. But but there is there is yeah. there are forces that are trying to corrupt our innocence and de- and push us further into separation and deny mm-hmm. the divine that are out there that seem both incarnate and also mm-hmm. outside mm-hmm. of incarnated presence. Well, they don't you know they don't talk about other forces. They do talk about the action of fear, and they talk about fear as a strata vibration, which I assume would be encompassing of this. When they say the action of fear is to claim more fear, which is what they've always said, they're speaking to this. Fear seeks to replicate itself like a cancer, you know, and Mm -hmm. every choice any one of us makes in fear, they say will get us more of the same. And at the collective level, when we're all invited to be in fear, then you have the residual affect of that at a very large scale. I understand something that I didn't about this. They said finally... You know, they said fear isn't wise. Fear doesn't really transcend. Fear is actually kind of can't go past its own baseline. It's not, it's clever perhaps, but it's not wise, Mm. you know. And so you move to a level where you're no longer choosing and aligning from that. Does that mean it's no longer there? I don't know that it means that it's no longer there. I think it stops becoming active like anything else. I mean, I, you know, stopped drinking when I was 25. I think it would be a bad idea if I started again, but I'm no longer activating an addiction Mm -hmm. by not imbibing, you know, the thing that's going to take me down that road. So I'll ask the guides about this, but where I get cautious is that people sometimes like to dine out on the dark stuff because it's sexy, you know, and it's (laughs) And I don't know that that necessarily gets us a lot back because the idea of being a warrior concerns me sometimes because a warrior needs a battle and needs a war. Right. And I think that things can be transformed in other ways. I'm not negating the fact that people take action at different levels and at different times, different kinds of action are required and necessary, you know? So let me go to them quickly. Let me, let me just, yeah. uh, let, b- before you do, I just want to comment okay. on this on this fear because I had a very profound revelation that's right in alignment with that. Um, oh. And I was doing ayahuasca recently. Mm-hmm. And in the ayahuasca journey, of course, you know, this is a big part of my path, mm-hmm. the plant medicine path. And that's my way to be able to connect. Mm-hmm. And I actually encountered the entity of fear. Mm-hmm. the kind of this amorphous entity of fear. It was capital F fear itself. Mm-hmm. And I could feel fear trying to scare me as mm-hmm. a recruitment tactic to get me to join it. 
It was like a conversion. It was like a, yeah. the the fear Jehovah's Witness, you know, like, yeah. let me get you afraid so you can join in my fear. And I had to stand and it was showing me lots of scary things, like as much as clever as it could to show me things to get me to be afraid. And I just looked at fear eyes, you know, my third mm -hmm. eye, of course, my eyes are closed, but third eye unblinking and said, I'm not afraid, like I will not join you. And it was a, it was a very powerful moment. And I think that speaks to this fear energy. And I, and I have a, I have a visceral understanding. Again, I, I know that in my body now and everything that the guides have been saying about fear mm -hmm. seeks to replicate itself. Fear mm -hmm. wants to claim more fear. It was trying to actually convert me. It was like trying mm -hmm. to convert me to the religion of fear, mm -hmm. you know, in my body to get me to be afraid so I could join it. And so I understand that. And then what I'm curious about though, and this is, so this is the point for the guides mm -hmm. is, and I'm not saying that the, the, the logical conclusion of this curiosity is that the warrior must come in and fight it, but there's some, mm -hmm. seems to be something beyond fear, which is intentional malice, intentional yeah. malice. Yeah. And yeah. that's yeah. what I'm, and that's what I'm curious about. Well, that's when they've, you know, when they've taken on the subject of evil, that's how they've described it pretty much. It's the intent to do harm. It is the intent. Now, the challenging thing is, for me, is they say all things are of God, but they're operating at different levels of tone. And they, they talk about octaves. And the lowest octave is still part of the whole, but it's just having a different expression. And that doesn't mean that it's a good thing. It just means that you can't I don't know that you can separate it or excise it. You have to reclaim it and lift it, you know, and it's a challenging, challenging thing for me. Um, but let me go and see if they want to jump in on this in some way. And, you okay, know, great. But I haven't heard me, you know, I whisper and repeat and it's awkward as can be, but it's how it happens. <laughs> They're saying the idea of fear is what needs to be addressed and the idea of who you think you are and the idea of who you think you are emblazoned by fear. Emblazoned by fear is what is being addressed. No, is what is being addressed now at a, at a at a mutual level, at a communal, at a communal level, at a, at a large level, the truth of who you are, the truth of who you are, the divine self, if you're sure the divine self, if you wish, is not abiding fear, does not abide in fear. And in fact, the upper room, and in fact, the upper room is not a place of fear, is not a place of fear. The tone cannot be played here. The tone cannot be played here. Your experience in the common field, your experience in the common field of what you know of is fear, of what you know of is fear is actually a collective agreement, is actually a collective agreement that can we move on, that can and will be moved beyond when you see the truth of it, when you see the futility of it. If you look at this as a battle, if you look at this as a battle to be fighting forever, you will be fighting forever. Mm -hmm. If you look at it as a low strata, as a low strata of choice, and of choice and vibration, you can remedy it. You can remedy it or align it to the higher or align it to the higher. Now, when the light shines upon the darkness, now when the light shines upon the darkness, the need for the darkness, the need for the darkness may be understood, may be understood when you stop requiring it. When you stop requiring it, stop requiring to be the winner, stop requiring to be the winner at the cost of losing, at the cost of somebody losing, you may transcend, you may transcend even the idea of war, even the idea of war, the action of fear, yes. The action of fear, yes, to create more fear, to create more fear is understood, is understood, but, for this. but you're all participatory to this. And when you look at this as a villain seeking to conform you, seeking to conform you or convert you to fear or convert you to fear, you actually empower it even more. You actually empower it even more. It's an idea. It's an idea that has taken shape, that has taken shape in the idea of fear. And the idea of fear is finally all you grapple with, is finally all you grapple with when the idea of fear is released, when the the idea of fear is released, enacting it is released as well, enacting it is released as well. And that is what you're on the cusp of. And that is what you are on the cusp of, period. And you're saying, period. Mm. I'm in full, full alignment to that. And, mm. uh, and with all respect to our, mm. you know, to the guides and their wisdom and their brilliance and you, I still feel a little bit unresolved with mm -hmm. their being Intentional malice does not necessarily, in my understanding, require fear because you could intend malice from a place, not that they're, not that it's afraid because there's, there's one way that I'm afraid. Let me go take this from you because I'm afraid or I'm afraid. Let me go kill you because I'm afraid. And I get that. I get that. Yeah. I'm talking about a different, which is like, I'm not afraid and I'm not using me personally, I'm, but I'm just saying like a being, I'm not afraid. I'm just trying to fuck this thing up intentionally, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, and it can be, so the evil yeah. that's devoid of fear. 
They haven't talked about that. But what they say is that the only problem that humanity really has is what they call the denial of the divine. And that would mm. be an example of that. That's yeah. it. But that's our creation, they say. That's our responsibility. Now, do I think that there are like parasitic energies that we can get attached to and screw with us? Yeah, I do. You know, they're not nice. They're low-level things, and I think they need to be reclaimed in a higher way. Mm -hmm. It's a hard one for me. You know, I am a child of a Holocaust survivor. My father was in a kinder sure. transport and sent to England. I mean, there are things that I can't rationalize kinds of cruelty that we we enforce upon each other and what's even harder to, for me to understand is that we're all oddly party to these things you know the collective agreement to what we've accepted and what is acceptable must be understood as something that we're complicit with so let me go back to the guys on the action of fear as sort of or the action of cruelty or malice and malice yeah if they want to say this the intention to harm is always the action of fear, whether or, not, whether or not you give it another name. All the idea of sin is all the idea of sin is, if you wish to use that term, if you wish to use that term, it's not one, is the devile of the divine. Cruelty itself, cruelty itself is, an act, is an enactment of fear. It's the aggression of fear. It's the aggression of fear or seeking to become fearful or seeking to become fearful or to be as harm or to be as harm. One, the denial of the divine can be, as many, can be understood in many ways. The aspect of you, the aspect of of you knows who he is, who knows who he is, the true self we wish. The true self, if you wish, is not capable. That is not capable of that. It would not induce, it would not induce the suffering of another, the suffering of another through its intention, through its intention, the low level of alignment. The low level of alignment that you're all party to, that you are all party to, presents this as an opportunity, presents this as an opportunity, and it's a disfigurement, and it's a disfigurement in some ways, in some ways, of your true natures, of your true natures, the truth of innocence. The truth of innocence is that the truth of you is that the truth of you is actually loved, is actually loved and is in love and is in love. The distortions you speak to, the distortions you speak to, which can become empowered, which can become empowered or fueled by hatred or fueled by hatred, which is also born in fear, which is also born in fear of the negation and or the negation of the divine must be understood, must be understood as a creation of humanity, as a creation of humanity that you're moving on, that you are moving beyond. And you know you must do this and you know you must must do this to maintain the species to maintain the species period and the same period mm. yeah that's that's really that makes more sense because then it's okay there's two buckets one is fear and mm -hmm. one is the denial of the divine yeah and w either way one one or both of those are in action when mm -hmm. you see something like malice yeah. actually out in the world it's the denial of the divine and fear or you know and that's that uh that makes makes a lot of sense because I, I think there's I don't have it um exactly here but I know I have a quote from you in front of me in one of these many quotes that I pulled but you know fundamentally the idea that if you are in the upper room you would never actually harm anybody because you see yourself as connected to the source field you see yourself and everybody else as another expression of life yeah. you know and so as you see yourself as a part of life there is no pleasure in harming another Mm -hmm. because you realize that you're harming yourself so the, it just it, it can't yeah. really it can't really work it has to it, it's it's necessary to be in the delusion of the myth of separation and it's seductive you know i mean it, it's seductive the, the desire to be special the desire to maintain a sense of separation the desire to win at the cost of somebody losing now the guides have said self-righteousness is always the small self it's always the personality self because the true self or the divine self isn't in that game. It mm -hmm. doesn't have an axe to grind in the same way. But it's a, it's a challenge, I know. It's a challenge for me. Um, but I do know that for me, the level of fear that I used to live in is not present. You know, things are still tainted by it, I suspect. But I'm not, you know, the kid that I was. In a lot yeah. of ways, I've grown through that and I'm grateful for it. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've also, since the last time we spoke, I've had some profound psychonautic experiences. I mentioned one vignette from an ayahuasca journey, uh -huh. but 
one of these, one of the um, passages that you have in the book really reminded me of a, a very distinct moment that I had. And so I'm going to read the passage. On this day, I choose to allow the manifest divine, the truth of who I really am, to claim me in fullness, imparting its wisdom, imparting its joy, its awareness to source, its awareness of source, to be my teacher, to be my ally, to be my expression, fullness of being. As I say yes to this, I allow this merging. As I say yes to this, I agree to this manifestation. As I say yes to this, I say yes to God as all that is and can be. I am word through this intention, word I am word. So in that, there was a very profound moment where I have uh, distinct contact which, with what I would call my, um, my I, you could just call it my soul. Mm -hmm. It seems to have a, a star origin, and I want to get into that as well because mm -hmm. it's part of my own cosmology. I could call mm -hmm. it my star self or my soul. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an oversoul where Aubrey mm -hmm. is just one of the lives that this oversoul has lived. And so, and I felt that that soul come in and say to me, Aubrey, say, I'm coming in. And I go, okay. And it goes, are you sure? You're like, are you sure you want yeah. me to come in? And I was like, yeah, I'm sure. And it's like, it, yeah. it asked like three times. It was like, are you really sure yeah. that you want me to come in? And I was like, yeah, I'm really sure. And it was, it's been a time of, you know, some difficulty for me in this mm -hmm. stretch. And, and that force kind of came in and it gave me a deep sense of, of peace. And it also mm -hmm. was able to really disentangle me from fear and allow me to navigate and mm -hmm. see things from a from a very like almost white light clarity but it was very precise and it didn't actually it didn't have um it didn't have the kind of warmth that that the mm -hmm. aubrey does aubrey has a very golden light energy like i'm very warm and yeah. this was much like nope this is how it is i ha i i love it was no denial of the divine absolutely yeah. not no no badness but it was very very efficient <laughs> it was like very efficient this is what needs to happen this is what you but and it was very interesting how that that force has been stronger and stronger in me and it seems like i've been able to merge that with myself mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. greater way and it's now kind of always present but i'm also able to still drop back into the Aubrey and, and, mm -hmm. and get, get in yeah. all my feels too. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a lot of ways what the guys are teaching. I mean, the experience that you're describing is comparable. I've had, when I was younger, when I was in my maybe early 30s and I was first starting to channel, I used to feel like I had a tin can up to my ear on a string and I would just hope somebody would talk into the other tin can because I was really worried people would gather and I wouldn't be able to hear. And I was a wreck about this almost every week because I didn't understand any of how it worked. And then eventually, one day, they said before a group, do we have permission to merge? And mm. it was a very similar experience. And from mm -hmm. then on, it's just like turning a dial to that other yeah. voice. You know, it's not like I have to reach elsewhere. And when the guides step into me and they work, you know, and they work one-on-one -on -one with people at times, you know, it's extraordinary. The feeling is extraordinary. And there is deep compassion and deep love and a kind of neutrality, I think. That the neutrality, that. exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's what's interesting about it. It's really interesting. And it's divine neutral is, you know, how I, what I call it. You know, it's neither good nor bad. It just is, mm -hmm. you know, it just is. And it is without the old agenda. And it is without my personality chiming in and saying, you better be careful what you do or say or how it's seen or all those things. It just is. Mm -hmm. And it's an extraordinary experience. Um, they say, and that's really what they're teaching now, I think in the Book of Innocence and the one they just completed, is how that's maintained, how you operate at that level. And because, it, and as you said, it doesn't come at the cost of what you enjoy or who you spend no, your time with or what you love. But they said, you know, one of the very first things they ever said to me, and I might have told this to you before years ago, and I was very young and just opening up and very confused by it all. I heard freedom will come when the throne relinquishes its king. And I thought, what the hell does that mean? But it basically is who's, who's running the show, who sits in the throne. And they said the personality has its place. But our confusion is we think it's the king. Yeah, you know, we think yeah, the yeah. The yeah. structure is running everything and it need not. 
So I think what you're talking about is just what they're speaking to. Yeah, it's it's now oh, it's almost like the it's almost a hollowing out experience yeah, exactly. I've had. It's like a hollowing out, and then but I still have the full, you know, the full uh, costume of the personality self that I and it's always with me, and it's always mm-hmm. one you know one just little shift away, and I can step fully into the. And and the beautiful parts of it are always are always there as well. But it's like there's a hollowing out of my attachment to that as being who I am. And uh, it's been a it's been a, a really beautiful process. But also created a lot of massive kind of disruption in relationships and everything in my life as well. Because it's yeah. it's a different it's a different thing. I'm not the same person that mm-hmm. I exactly thought I was. You yeah. know, I'm something that includes and transcends that person. Yeah. I get it. You know, I get it. In, in the book that they just dictated, they actually use the metaphor a lot of becoming like a flute or a, an instrument that's being hollowed out so that God or source can play through right. it. You know, and that that's really what the work is, I think. You know, they don't talk about it as the work. I think of it as the work. Mm-hmm. But in an earlier book, you know, they brought everybody to the upper room and they said, the claim is, I have come, I have come, I have come. And they said, it's the divine self or the monad that announces this. What they also said was, get ready for the shit to fly because basically <laughs> yeah, every aspect sure. of you that's been held in darkness or we want to repress or suppress needs to be renowned and reseen and reclaimed. And reclamation is really the key. Or you can call it redemption if you want, although that's a word that's been... I think misappropriated in some ways, but they say the, the divine self or the true self or the Christ itself, whatever you want to call it, is capable of reclaiming all of this and will, mm. you know, mm-hmm. and as you said early on when you were asked, you know, is this okay or can I merge about the merging? Yeah. That I understand too is essential because I think we do have free will. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the guides always ask, you know, they don't override free will. They really don't. They respect it. I've often said, you know, if I want to walk into traffic, they're going to let me. If I say, is this a good time to cross the street? They might say, not wise. And not wise. <laughs> if you want to kill yourself, you can, but it's really not going to be what you want. And I, and yeah. I trust that now. This is, so this brings up a very, a very important point where I feel a little stuck. And so where I feel a little stuck is I felt my faith in the divine growing Mm -hmm. exponentially. I see signs Mm -hmm. everywhere. I feel the divine with me. I hear the whispers, not in the same way that you do, you know, but I, I, I hear them in my body. I feel, I hear them somatically and ideas and thoughts and a knowing of things. And then I also have a deep respect and recognition for free will and the choices yeah. that people can make. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes I will have a, a deep sense of, oh, this is the possibility that's being presented. Mm-hmm. And then I will witness somebody make a choice to close down that possibility. Mm-hmm. And, and I see that in the, in the smaller scale, in the micro, but I also recognize that in the macro. And so it starts to it starts to affect my faith in a certain way because I'm like, well, I God, like God, I understand. I yeah. understand what your desire is and I, I have faith in you so much. And I also know that you're granting free will. So where my faith starts to lapse is I guess it's faith in people to choose mm-hmm. the higher octave expression. And so that's where my faith gets challenged. So when I'm like, do you have faith in the world? Yes, I have because I have faith in God. But then I sometimes go, well, fuck, but how much faith do I have in people to be willing to choose the action of of the divine moving through them? Well, I understand everything that you're saying. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I have given up on trying to tell people what to do. You know, I really don't. I'm not interested. And the guides don't tell people what to do either. They offer choice and we can take them. They talk a lot about will in their work. And they talk, they talk about it as a braiding of the will. You know, we've coming from some of us, perhaps. I mean, I was raised sort of an atheist, but this idea of thy will not mine be done as if there are polarities here. And I think where they're taking us is to a unified will or the divine self or the true self comprehends the needs of the small and the two, the two wills sort of braid. And I understand that the higher will 
begins to claim itself in fullness, mm-hmm. but not at the cost of the old. It's a respect, I think, of the individual. It's not about abandoning self. It's about allowing self to be known and to be met. So the question then is, how does the world change if nobody wants to choose the higher? Now, what the guides teach now, which is challenging as hell, you know, and I'm understanding it because it's where they've been going throughout all the books, and I just didn't really know where they were going, is moving to a level of alignment where you become, in some ways, a transistor or a broadcast of the higher. And entrainment or vibrational accord is what begins to alter what you encounter. They talk about the title of the book, the 12th book, which is the last of this, these teachings, I understand. There's other stuff they want to talk about later. Is a world made new, and they're really talking about how this occurs at the level of the individual and the collective. And it's an enormous transition and a very ungraceful one, I think, because we're so moored into what we've known. But they say when a seed sprouts from the earth, you know, it moves the earth around it. There's always disruption. So I'm going to go to your question with them if I can and see if okay, they can. How do you how do you address the lack of high choice? Mm-hmm. Well, you're choosing for yourself and how you embody and how you embody actually elicits a couple of them, actually elicits a comparable response, even response to resistance, even if the response is resistance from those you encounter, from those you encounter when you are becoming light, when you are becoming the light, you are shining upon that which no one shines on. You are shining upon that which does not want which to be shined on. It will revolt and it will revolt and then remedy itself and then remedy itself because finally it understands, because finally it understands that the way forward, that the way forward forward is not back into the darkness is not back into the darkness even though they've been trained to it even though they have been entrained to and not what you're discovering now what you're discovering is people aren't going to do what you want, or is that people aren't going to do what you want and release the outcome and you release the outcome or the idea that they should or the idea that they should you will find less resistance you will find less resistance in fact the ways are being paved in fact the ways are being paved for all humanity for all humanity in different paths perhaps and different paths perhaps perhaps to align to a higher template, to align to a higher template. The higher template is the upper room. The higher template is the upper room or the octave, or if you prefer the octave above the one you've known, above the one you have known. There are things that don't exist there. And there are things that do not exist there, ways of expressing, or ways of expressing through hatred and fear, through hatred and fear that are not aligned, that are not aligned and will disperse and will disperse. This will take several generations. This will take several generations to manifest fully, to manifest fully, but the ongoing process is present but the ongoing process is present people are waking up people are waking up you're experiencing resistance you're experiencing the resistance some do not want to get out of bed some do not want to get out of bed they need to be tossed out of bed they need to be tossed out of bed (laughs) level and at a soul level they will incur that they will incur that when it's required when it's required Mm. yeah i think that uh I think that piece of guidance that I'm getting from that is to release the expectation of outcome, even if I can feel that there is a higher choice available. There's a, there's a dinner, there's a, there's a feast being served in the upper room. And I'm like, y'all, if y'all just climb, if y'all just climb the stairs, there's a whole feast and you're eating scraps down yeah. here in the living room, you know, and it's, it's like, come on, let's go upper room, come yeah. on, you know, but, but it, it's also like that kind of, that kind of desire and expectation actually may actually prevent them from wanting to just walk up th- to the upper room well, on their own accord. People don't trust that they have a right to go there and they don't want to be disappointed. And I think there are reasons for that. You know, the, the, th- third book I think that the guides dictated through me was called the book of knowing and worth. And they talked about this sort of collective belief we have, and we've gotten, you know, foisted on by, by religion, which is that we're basically sinful and not worthy, which is not true. You know, they're anxious. They're all, they're always saying you're claiming your inheritance here. This is your true inheritance. You know, it's yours to claim, but we don't know that we're allowed And also, sometimes people think you're not going to have any fun if you do this, or you're not going to get what you want. And that's usually what you think you want. (laughs) The guys are saying... Let me just clear that up. For anybody who thinks you're not going to have fun, as you... as I'm having a lot of fun. 
all the fun is still on the table. It's actually, and you told, you were actually, I had that same fear. Remember, we could, we could rewind that. the tape three years ago and I'd be like, but I'm worried I won't be as much fun. Maybe I won't, you know, maybe sex won't be as much fun and maybe basket, playing basketball won't be as much fun. Oh, it's more fun. The more, the more that I'm able to go to the upper room, the more fun it is. Basketball and sex are more fun mm -hmm. in the upper room. Like straight up, I can test, I can testify like a, like a inspired Baptist preacher. Like it is more fun up in the upper well, room. It is for you're sure. Present. You're present for it. And also I suspect what begins to happen is that the innate holiness, for lack of a better word, of all of these things comes, becomes part of your experience. I mean, yeah. now the guides are teaching that you about, and they're really getting into this now, is that the senses are amplified and changed. And we're, we've been operating at a very, very limited capacity. Now, plant medicine hasn't been part of my journey. And I'm fascinated by it. It's just not been part of my journey. But I understand that people, when they are working with the guide stuff, often have experience that's comparable. You know, they're seeing mm -hmm. the stuff, they're seeing the energy, they're feeling it. And I'm very happy for that. But I think that we have this innate ability to, I'll just call it see God. But seeing God yeah. isn't some guy in a cloud. It's everything experienced you know i don't do the, you know it's funny because i take the dictation for these things i'm not always the best student but i'm better than i used to be by a lot but i you know i i just, just was sitting outside today and i started you know basically blessing the tree this big tree in my yard that i, I hmm. just take for granted and i felt the energy of the tree just pouring back at me <laughs> and i'm yeah. like this is what they're talking about and the guys have always said what you bless blesses you in return and they say what a blessing is is the the claiming of the inherent divine they always say inherent divine where it has been denied you're seeing the divine that must be there in the fabric of all manifestation, like it or not, agree with it or not. That doesn't mean you're blessing somebody's poor conduct or, 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 or hard acts, but you perhaps are seeing the inherent divine in that human being where he or she has most denied it and then is enacting that denial, which changes people. You know, that's real. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think actually you can bless uh, a, an act in, made in separation, but you, you, but you still, you don't excuse it necessarily. Exactly, yeah. you don't, you're not condoning it, but you're, you're not condoning it. Condoning is the right yeah. word. Yeah. Yeah. You're not condoning it. You're, you're, you're claiming the presence of the divine where it's been denied. I mean, they're really simple teachings. The guides say what you damn damns you back. What you bless you know? blesses and, you back. And what yeah. you bless. But the funny thing is you can feel it. Yeah, I absolutely. Mean, you, can, you can feel the energy come back. The guides, when they first started teaching that used to call it the echo. And they'd have all their students go outside, stand like 20 feet apart and claim the inherent divine in, in the body of the partner 20 feet away. And the energy field of the partner would just sort of, it was like a bell ringing. You just feel the peals of energy or the waves of energy coming. And I think these things are available to us far more than we know. And part of the reason we don't walk around experiencing them is that we haven't been told we're allowed to, mm -hmm. or that we're not supposed to, or you can't or there's yeah. something to be fearful of. I mean, perhaps for many people, you know, plant medicine is opening up the roof that was in limitation and allowing other things. You know, for me, it's been this strange work, which I still yeah. don't know how it happened for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. I have a couple, I have a couple things, a couple queries that are not exactly on the same thread, but I want to, yeah. I want to talk about them because I was with, um, you know, I was with my best friend. We were, he was playing a football game and everything was lined up. He poured his heart into it. He's out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, for those of you who don't know, my friend is Aaron Rodgers. He's a quarterback for the New York Jets. And he was out there and it was about to be this, it was, it was a heroic story that was laid out. Mm -hmm. And fourth play of the game, he gets an Achilles rupture, which is a very serious injury. Mm -hmm. And it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. And when I was talking to him, you know, there was in my, in my idea, it was like, well, you know, there's a couple ways to look at this one. This is d divine providence and we just don't know it yet. And part mm -hmm. of that is our choice to make sure that it's divine providence by the actions mm -hmm. that we take following it. Mm -hmm. 
Another part is this could be some, you know, snake bite from what I believe that there are forces that are in resistance to, you know, to us. Could be it could have been a, a snake bite of a certain sort, or it could have just been maybe there's just chaos built into and yeah. randomness, chaos and randomness. So my real question is not necessarily about divine providence or the dark force. We've covered that, yeah. but my question is is like what is the what is the play of of chaos and randomness in our, in our world. I'm going to go to them with this because I'm, you know, I'm confused by this at a personal level. You know, I live on Maui yeah. and, you know, there was devastation, you know, on this island recently. Um, let me just see what they want to say. And if they want to take this, we would like to. They're saying we would like to. Well, chaos is a lot. Chaos is an adjective, as an adjective, a way of describing the things you can't, a way of describing the things that you cannot understand. Finally, there is divine order. Finally, there is divine order. Indeed, things happen. Indeed, things happen that would not be chosen, that would not be chosen. Perhaps there are accidents, and perhaps there are accidents or things that are understood later, or under things that are understood later as having meaning, as having meaning that are incomprehensible, that are incomprehensible at the time they occurred, at the time that they occurred. You're looking at your lives in very small ways. You're looking at your lives in very small ways not a continuum, not in a continuum of life, of life as a whole, as a whole in the immediacy, but in the immediacy of your personal circumstances, of your personal circumstances. Now, when one is injured, now when one is injured, maybe varying reasons, there may be varying reasons for an injury, for an injury. The one driving the car, the one driving the car may have been driving well, may have been driving well and hit from behind and hit from behind. The one hit from behind, the one hit from behind may indeed be injured, may indeed be injured. You can look at this as chaotic. You can look at this chaotic or finding we suggest, or finally, we suggest as an opportunity for something new, as an opportunity for something new to be comprehended and to be comprehended or understood. The reliability, the reliability of your temporary of your temporary reality, as you understand it, as you understand, is being accosted these days. Is being accosted these days. What you thought would be there tomorrow, what you thought would be there tomorrow, is not there tomorrow. Is not there tomorrow. The person you loved, the person you thought you loved, who would not leave, who would not leave, maybe going elsewhere, maybe going elsewhere. Where institutions are failing, institutions are failing, structures are falling, structures are falling. There is chaos. There is chaos as part of the change, as part of the change that you are incurring, that you are incurring when you pull back enough. When you pull back enough and bear witness to a life and bear witness to a life, you will understand meaning. You will understand meaning. You may not like the meaning. You may not like the meaning. We're not saying say people deserve. We are not saying people deserve or choose what they get or choose what they get. If there is calamity, if there is calamity, somebody leaves a match in Somebody leaves a match in the ground. The house may burn. The house may burn. Somebody doesn't forget. Somebody doesn't forget to turn off the oven. To turn off the oven, there will be a problem. There will be a problem. These things can be seen as accidents. These things can be seen as accidents. Some of them are. Some of them are. They can be seen as nefarious. They can be seen as nefarious. Perhaps some of them are. Perhaps some of them are. If the one driving the car, if the one driving the car was intending to hit the person, was intending to hit the person before them, you may call that evil. You may call all that evil or an aggressive act or an aggressive act you would not be wrong you would not be wrong but finally we suggest but finally we suggest at the end of a lifetime at the end of a lifetime you have comprehension you have comprehension about what real meaning is about what real meaning is what the opportunity was what the opportunity was how the soul was engaging in an event how the soul was engaging in an event and what benefit there might be and what benefit there might be from re-seeing it now from re-seeing it now it is very hard it is very hard to perceive eternity to perceive eternity when you're focused on what happened yesterday when you are focused on what happened yesterday what you think tomorrow should be or what you think tomorrow should be but you do know but you do know that every moment is eternity that every moment is eternity and time itself and time itself is how you abdicate is how you abdicate your soul's authority your soul's authority to a situation to a situation period in their same period mm. beautiful yeah beautiful wisdom there it's like it's only chaos from our perspective, but from the perspective of the eternal, there mm -hmm. is a divine order that can be seen. Yeah. There's another purview that we may yeah. never get access to. You know, we may not in our not in our current mm -hmm. embodied existence, but uh, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I'll say it. You know, I you know I you know my I didn't know, know Ram Das. You know, his I'm part of the sat song, you know, that was developed at his house yep. and they're lovely people and they're my friends. And some of the kids who were caregiving Ram Das became my good friends. And, um, 
would tell me stories, you know, and a lot of it was really about how he grew after the stroke and how his spiritual teachings became embodied for him at a personal level, you know, after he lost some of the ability of his body and speech, which I found extraordinary, you know, I mean, I'm not there, you know, I may never be mm-hmm. there, but I think how we can opportunize everything as an op- as something to be learned from or changed yeah. with, I think is crucial to our not claiming victimhood as identity. You know, there are Mm -hmm. times when people are victimized. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but I am saying that when that becomes one's identity, one will accrue more and more and more evidence of the same. And that's how we work. This reminds me of a Toltec teaching that I first encountered from Carlos Castaneda, but has been, um, you know, reified through and reinforced through Don Miguel Ruiz and and some of the other Toltec masters is... um, for the ordinary person, everything is a blessing or a curse. Yeah. You're either, a, but for the Nagual or for the master or for the warrior, they use warrior Nagual. Nagual yeah. is kind of a master for them. There are only challenges. Yeah. For the Nagual, there are only challenges. And, mm-hmm. and those are opportunity. And every challenge is an opportunity. Yeah. And then there's an opportunity that arises in a whole path that develops of opportunity um, on the other side of that. And that's, mm-hmm. That seems to be just a, a very sound principle to have is to not say, you know, that this thing that happened is bad or good because you don't know yet. Yeah. You know, so it's just like, well, we're going to find out. And through my act of will, through my act of intent, which is another deep Toltec teaching, through my act of intent, I'm going to make sure that this has an, a deep and powerful meaning. You know, Ramdas made the choice when he couldn't speak because of his aphasia. He's like, well, now I'm going to live more in my heart, you know, and that was a choice to give yeah. that the meaning. And that's what, that's mm-hmm. what you're, you know, what you're referring to is that there's, there's always the choice, no matter what happens, there's the choice of how we respond to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. We're in an interesting time as well in the collective. And this is again, another one of these questions that I've been eager to see if the guides wanted to weigh in on. There's been a massive movement towards disclosure of what is now called unidentified anomalous phenomena, UAPs. Used to be called UFOs, now it's called UAPs. And there's been a lot of testimony from different people in different naval naval sources, military sources, intelligence sources who've now, because the Whistleblower Act has been lifted, they've been free to actually testify that there have they have whole hosts of <clears throat> unidentified anomalous phenomena. They actually have mm-hmm. recovered crafts. This is the testimony, recovered crafts mm-hmm. and what they say are biologics. And mm-hmm. we're now at this time where this is becoming more generally accepted and seems yeah. to be escalating that we're mm-hmm. actually starting to see ourselves and our lives as connected to call it the galactic federation or the star nations or other mm-hmm. beings beyond the planet. Mm-hmm. And it seems like this is somehow playing some role in this time of transition that we're in right now. It seems it would be a hell of a coincidence that this is all coming out also at this deep time of transition. So just curious to see if the guides, which are an, (laughs) they are an anomalous phenomenon, right? I mean, Melchizedek is itself an anomalous phenomenon. It doesn't show up in crafts all the time. Maybe it does sometimes, I don't know. But, but what's there? Do they have any guidance? Have they talked about this phenomenon that's kind of happening? Not so much, really. I mean, I think, you know, surprisingly not in some ways. But at the same time, it feels like a benevolent nod to what's happening. Like, of mm-hmm. course, is what I would suggest. That would be the response they've had. They rarely bring it up. The, the very first time I the very first time I did a book signing at the old Bodhi tree in Los Angeles, there were like five people there. And I was reading the book and somebody raised their hand in the second row and they said said to me like, this sounds like those evil aliens that the gun, the the galactic, what do the guys say about the evil aliens? And the guys hadn't been saying anything and they piped right in and said, isn't it bad enough that you can't get along here? You have to vilify the rest of the universe. (laughs) That was their response. And then they shut up and I thought, well, that's a good way 
to address it. So let me see if they want to say anything. The idea that there is life elsewhere, the idea that there is life elsewhere is no surprise, is no surprise. How you attend to it, how you attend to it, and how gracefully you can attend to it, and how gracefully you can attend to it will be the surprise, will be the surprise. In fact, you've been prepared for this. In fact, you have been prepared for this for many, many years, for many, many years. The idea of life, the idea of life resembling you, resembling you, or even resembling form, or even resembling form, which need not be form, which need not be form, but maybe an idea, but maybe an idea form that you utilize, that you utilize is so present now, is so present now in the in the energy field of the planet, of the planet, that you are aligning to the possibilities, that you are aligning to the possibilities, things are not what you think, that things are not what you think or what you should have them be or what you should have them be through prior conceit, through prior conceit. What is occurring now? What is occurring now is a reestablishment, is a reestablishment of humanity, of humanity as species, as species. You have forgotten species. You have forgotten species. You think in terms of race, religion. You think in terms of race or religion, our countrymen, our countrymen, you do not think of species. You do not think of species. And until you understand that you are one, and until you understand that you are one, you'll be contending with malice. You will be contending with malice, creating fruit creating, in other words, feud, feud and fire and fire that you must connect, that you must decide means something, means something other than the intent behind it, other than what is them and other than the intent behind it. If you want a war, you can war. If you want a war, you can war. When you know you're warring with your brother, when you know you are warring with your brother, you will not war, you will not war, period. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this is this is the time to, to start, I see us, the necessity for us to come together as representatives of planet earth the species of humans representing mm -hmm. you know representing gaia sophia the the this planet's highest manifestation of life so far mm -hmm. and and so it's um it's a very interesting it's an interesting moment uh that i think has a lot more potential beauty to it than a lot than fear but i but of course people may take it as a fearful thing but that's the wrong i really think that's the wrong way to look at it I think if people are looking for somebody to hate, you can find somebody and you can find it in any form. You know, if you, if you want that, you can find that. I had a mentor years ago. She was a wonderful old time medium. And she said to me that humanity's progress is actually being monitored by other systems because mm -hmm. everything is trying to move forward and we're holding it back. You know, our <laughs> being stuck in the mud and stuck in our ways is actually preventing everything from going forward. Yeah. And I understand that that's what's happening now. And I think it's a positive. I really do. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Now, here's another thing that's, you know, kind of becoming very present. And this is the proliferation of artificial intelligence. Yeah. And of course, people are approaching this in similar ways. Some people with extreme fear, some people with mm -hmm. extreme excitement. But yeah. it is undoubtedly a disruptive force. So have the guides weighed in on this artificial intelligence kind of topic that's uh, only that's once. impending? Only once. And it was a number of years ago. And it was in a podcast with Duncan Trussell, actually. And I remember asked, that. Uh, yeah, I remember asked, that. We need to be, and he asked the guides. I barely knew what it was. I mean, you know, I'm a... <laughs> you know. But the guides said, you know... I think the question was, will we, will we be overtaken? And they said, no, because artificial intelligence does not love. Mm. And that's going to be what I guess saves us. I'd have to go back and listen to, to the interview, but I was surprised that they said that. And at the time it made sense. And I'm sure they said it better than I just did. Um, I, what I hear is it's how you choose to work with it. It's how you choose to address the opportunity. The faction that will try to use it for rule will try. I hear, and it will not succeed. And it cannot, finally. And this has to do, and they've been speaking about this more in the last couple of years than ever, and I don't know what I think of it, because I was basically hearing humanity will not allow it. But they talk about humanity at times as almost having a collective soul, the species mm. having a soul mind. And they said, you know, you're not, you know, you've, you've come to a realization that if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to blow yourselves up and you're not going to allow that finally. You know that. Mm -hmm. And that's why everybody's sort of moving away and moving forward towards this new ideal. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, I want to, so 
the guides, mm -hmm. Melchizedek, you know, is this still, is that still the preferred name that they like to be used? They, they don't really they, like, they don't really like names very much, it seems like. I don't think they care. I mean, they're called yeah. the guides because my ex used to say, ask the guides this, ask the guides that. They didn't object, <laughs> so they landed with it. I was just speaking at a conference that Paul and the guides, I thought, well, that's funny. Everybody else, <laughs> you know, the, the title of their, of who they channel. They've said, it. you know, if you wish to call us something, you can call us Melchizedek. But they've also said, and I prefer this one, they said, we are who you become when you know who you are. And uh -huh. at times they've called themselves the true self. And that's, Christ. That's the Christ consciousness, the divine self or the true self. And right. I understand this all as a level of consciousness. You know, yep. there's one that I've seen and I've seen him a few times and he's remarkable to see. And, um, and, you know, for the most part, my experience is, is auditory or clear audience. You know, it's, it's like something that pushes all the other thoughts away. When I'm speaking with you, I'm still present when I'm channeling a book I'm far more receded, you know, I'm right really into the back seat and I stay there until the lecture is over. They're saying, well, they said Melchizedek is fine. So I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, well, well, I'm curious. And this wasn't even, I have, I have a second question, but it, it, I'm mm -hmm. interested in this. You, there are different slight tones of dictation yeah. words, like one mm -hmm. of, one of the guides, one in particular expression of the guides, which is a collective voice uses the words, my dears or something like yeah. that. It's like, a, it's a very kind of like affectionate term. Yeah. And then you've, you said you've also seen, you know, you've seen one of them. So they can almost merge as a collective consciousness, but then also split and have, you know, unique identities. If you were to ask that one that you see that appears as separate, but also connected because they're deeply mm -hmm. connected with the field, uh -huh. of course, do you have a name? You know, if you were to ask that one, do yeah. you have a name? Would there be a separate name than Melchizedek? Like, the, oh, no, I am so-and-so. Saying Melchizedek is the title and the, and the origin of the teaching of the teaching, period, period. It's, okay, this is Melchizedek as espoused, as espoused through these teachings, through these teachings. We are as the priesthood. We are as the priesthood and the being you know of as Melchizedek. And the being you know of as Melchizedek is too large, is too large to be brought through fully, to be brought through fully in channels. So it's caught. So it's caught in the discussion in the discussion as it can be led, as it can be led. In other words, in other words, the vibration of the teaching, the vibration of the teaching is Melchizedek, is Melchizedek, and Melchizedek has priesthood, and Melchizedek is priesthood, the two work concurrently. The two work concurrently, I say this. Mm. So the one that I saw, and I'll just, you know, because I don't, you know, I actually, I was getting hypnotized by somebody and I thought it was going to be something other. And then halfway through the session, he said, now your guide's going to come. And I'm going, oh, that's not going to happen. And he did. <laughs> And, um, wow. and I've seen him three times and always a version of the same, but he has pale blue eyes. When my, I've been told my eyes often turn pale blue when they're really through full blast. And the hat that he was wearing was almost like, a, like we'd seen like in Greek or Greek orthodoxy. It was very tall and it had a bit of a pancake at the top, you know, something uh -huh. at the top and a robe and a long, long beard, but he was holding a scepter. And the scepter was, had gold embossed hieroglyphics on it. Wow. And he was sitting beside me and I heard, and it was all telepathic. And he said, this is what we use to attune people. And I had recently been channeling and walking around with my hands like this, not knowing what I was doing. <laughs> he was explaining what was going on. I was holding the scepter. He was holding the scepter. And I was once at a conference at Esalen with some anthropologist who was saying, how do you know it's not you? How do you know? And I'm going, well, I guess I don't. I just know that I can't close my eyes and dictate. I don't know how many books there were at that time that don't need any editing because none of the books are edited. They're just transcriptions. Right. And then I went to this other meditation that this woman was running because I was going to be a nice participant and go to the other person's meditation. And I'm feeling crappy about this conversation with the anthropologist. And this woman is doing this endless guided visualization. Now you're walking down a hill and there's a ravine and there's a stream and you're going, get me out of this thing. And finally, I'm at the bottom of this hill, you know, the bottom in this gulch. And this woman says, and now your guide is going to come through. And I'm going, yeah, right. And I saw the <laughs> same guy that I saw with a big hat and a big beard tumbling down the hill, holding two 
what are they? Like the Torah or something, these two huge scrolls barreling wow. down the hill. And he said to me, stop trying to tell people who you are you don't know. And he went right back up the hill. <laughs> and I thought that was greater. Stop trying to explain to people because I'd been trying to explain the work to somebody who wasn't going to go there. Yeah. And I loved that one. That felt great. Yeah. And it was fun. And there was joy. And other times I've seen him in a library. Huge, 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 vast library. That's, that's beautiful. I, I've started to work with sacred objects in my own practice as well to understand that these objects may have a physical representation, but I don't use them in the physical. I use them in the, in the extra dimensional yeah. realms beyond. And so this scepter of attunement, you could call it, is like one of your sacred objects that mm -hmm. you use and you find yourself holding it. And it's a, it's been a powerful tool in my own, um, for my own psychonautic journey. So it's cool to hear you say that, that these sacred yeah. objects go all the way up and all the way down. But ultimately my question of for, Melchizedek and potentially your specific guide and whoever, whoever want, you know, wanted to speak on it is what, what I sense is, is that, you know, and many of them have taken bodies before and it's possible that they could take bodies again, presumably. And correct. if, if they were to take bodies again, the, what I'm curious about is, you know, one of the things that I see transforming is the nature of relationship itself and relationship speaking romantically which mm -hmm. is the typical dyadic yeah. monogamous relationship container and but also the relationship amongst what you could call tribe like your soul pod mm -hmm. or your or your mm -hmm. crew and i see yeah. what i see is a future reality where things are shared amongst those who you trust and resonate and vibrate with in a much different way. And I guess my curious question is, is if these beings were to come in, you know, and they would, would they look around and go like, oh, no, 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 we got to, we got to reimagine, we got to reimagine some of these structures of relationship that kind of abide not in the myth of separation. Cause you talk about that a little bit in this, like if I, um, I will become the one who chooses what he gets at the cost of another's desires. In other words, the belief that you will be controlled by another's love or desire for you is a way to prove separation. So it feels like there's a, they're pointing yeah. towards a new evolution in the future of relationship. I get that that's accurate. The idea of who you are separate, as separate reinforces separation, reinforces separation. Even if you bond with another, even if you bond with another, you decide yourselves as separate. You decide yourselves as separate. We are separate from the one next to us. We are separate from the ones next to us. You can have intimacy. You can have intimacy and deep knowing and sharing and deep knowing and sharing without the systems, without the systems that would replicate separation, without that would replicate separation. So we ask, what does this look like? He asked, it looks like love. It looks like love without the requirement of contract, without the requirement of contract or sanctification or sanctification from an institution from an institution period period <laughs> yeah that's what i and that's that's also you know it's the it's the complication of greater contact with with the with these the upper room version of myself it's like oh contracts contracts that define separation like the my my soul being is like it's fine do what you want whatever you want is cool like it's there's no there's no force or no pressure but it's like it's wearing a it's wearing a sweater that it that it doesn't really like to wear it's like I, i'll wear it you know but i don't i don't like this christmas sweater you know i'm i'm jewish <laughs> or whatever it's like i'll wear it but you know it's not like it's uh it doesn't exactly suit the the essence that i'm that i'm certainly feeling yeah i you know i don't you know, I don't know what I think. They, they've not, they, they don't knock marriage as an institution. They're all for commitment. I think where they seem to have some concern is the idea of the contracts that they say are primarily financially based and fear based. You know, I've, I'm, if you're my partner, you're not going to have sex with somebody else. If you're my partner, you know, all of these, all of the agreements that might be implicit. Now, those are things that people can choose. You can right. choose those things, but if they're not chosen in integrity, I don't know if they're necessarily going to last or are going to be healthy. If they're chosen in fear, they're bound with fear. Exactly right. And so then as you go to reclaim yourself as one outside of fear, those things have to be renowned and can be rechosen 
mm-hmm. out of love and yeah, out exactly of devotion right. and renown in a new way. But mm-hmm. it seems like if fear was the was the was the formation of the contract, the contract needs to be renown in a new way. And and that seems to be the way that it's understanding. And it seems as co- the collective transforms and I've been trying all different forms and and ways and and mm-hmm. trying all of the different ways but it seems like it's not only in romantic partnerships but it's also in friendships yeah. I see I what uh, the guidance that keeps coming is merge the kingdoms merge the kingdoms you know yeah. if I have powerful allies it's like why do you have a bank account and a house that's not their bank account and house when they're when you trust them with your life? Like you would literally mm-hmm. go stand with them. And again, we're not trying to get into battles, but using this as a metaphor, you would stand with them on any battle, face any storm. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. if if you would go to the end of the earth, the end of infinity with this person, then why not merge the kingdoms, trust each other, you know, develop a new level of of connection amongst brothers, amongst sisters, amongst the chosen, what in the Hawaiian word is ohana, your chosen mm-hmm. family, yeah. you know, and that it can include lovers, doesn't require lovers, but includes that as well. But it's this kind of, it, it's this collapse of separation as we understand relationship agreement between friends and lovers. I mean, I'm with you. I think if we begin to move towards a basis of community as something that's to be aspired to, I think that that's an extraordinary thing. And I think we're probably going to have to. You know, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I was isolated in my life in many ways. You know, I was a college teacher. I did my thing. I lived in Manhattan. I had my apartment. And since I moved to Maui, I really began to learn about community because I was welcomed into one. And it's been life changing for me. You know what happens and everything that you're describing yeah. is just love. It's what you do when you love somebody, you know, and when you, when you're not frightened of, of losing what you have, you know, the idea that it it takes something from us to care for somebody else, I think, is 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 something that we need to to look at carefully individually. You know, it's yeah. not always the case. Right, right. There's um, there's one another quote that I thought was really um, powerful from the book. The war within the self, which is born in the denial of the divine, is the basis of every war, every battle, and every act of violence that has ever occurred on this plane. And is there any guidance for, you know, how when someone really knows they're at war in themselves, when they're, to- when the toggling, because we talk about toggling, toggling from the upper room down to the lower room, the personality, small self structure to the other room, and it feels like both of those things are at war. Like, how, do, how does somebody practically help resolve that war? I hear forgiveness. That's the only key, which is really acceptance, forgiveness and acceptance, forgiveness and acceptance. We're kind of in work hand in hand. The battle within the self is not remedied, is not remedied by seeking to distort, by seeking to distort or separate or separate the self from the aspect of self, from the aspect of self that is so challenging, that is so challenging, nothing will be healed and nothing will be healed until it is first accepted, until it is first accepted or at least seen, or at least seen and recognized and recognized and then recognized as of God and then recognized as of God, period, nursing period. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's one, you know, one more thing I want to touch on too, which is the, I think there, the power of presence and being without action and doing is under indexed in its importance. And this is not Mm -hmm. something new in the book of innocence. This Mm -hmm. is something that's always been there, but Mm -hmm. I was just, you know, hoping for you and if guides want to come in, but, but just talk about how you know, actually we, we over index the importance of doing and under index the importance of presence and being and how someone being attuned to a higher vibrational field is Mm -hmm. itself an action that claims the higher field. And so Mm -hmm. I think helping people understand that it's not about every, it's not always about what you do. So what if you post and only, you know, 50 people see it, it doesn't make Mm -hmm. that less important, but if you're holding a sense of presence, that may be actually more important than someone yeah. posting to 50 million people, but mm-hmm. from a lower vibration, you know? So it's like kind of reimagining for those people who are able to hold that higher state of presence and being mm-hmm. and, and reifying the value of, of that action. You know, I thought that was going to be the title of the Book of Innocence was Presence and Being because they kept going back and back and back to that. And then they called it something entirely different. And I go, boy, this is going to be strange. I don't know what this is going to mean. 
in their earlier books, they bring through this attunement. I know who I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth. And the guides say how one serves is how one is most fully expressed as the true self. Now, people in our culture tend to think that that's what one does for a living or how one shows up, you know, ready to work. And I think those can be ways that we express, but I don't think it's what they're necessarily talking about. They're talking about moving to a level of alignment with your own knowing or the knowing of who you are. To know is to realize. And the guides have said the true self knows and the small self thinks. And the guides have also said that once one knows, when you truly know, you may be called to act from that place. Mm -hmm. So if I truly know something, I'm actually probably going to be impelled to act upon that knowing in some way. But yeah. I don't think that we get to the action without the knowing. Other than that, we're just doing the best we can, which is based on what we know. And all we know is what we've known prior. You know, the personality self, they say, is entirely constructed through historical data. You know, what we think it means to be a man or a woman or a teacher or this or that in the times that we're born in through cultural observance, how our families raised us and what our teachers said, all those things. When the guides claim, I'm, I am free, I am free, I am free, they're talking about being free, coming free of that level of entrainment or indoctrination in some ways to what we've expected which I think operates as a, a ceiling that we're moving past. And the ceiling is, you know, to the upper room. I am free, mm -hmm. I am free, I am free. I am in the upper room, which is the aspect of you that already abides there. People think that this is someplace you take a vacation at. But the guides mm -hmm. say the monad or the divine self, the God within you already expresses at that level of vibration and tone. And what yeah. you're doing in this teaching is transposing the music of the rest of you to play up there with the monad. And that is presence and being, you know, the work of your hands. I don't think this is done through hard effort. I think there are things that are effortful, but I don't think the work of the guides is effortful in that way. It's more about agreement. And in some ways I suspect more about allowance and surrender, allowing the divine within you to call itself forward. Cause you can't make God be God. God already is. <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely absolutely well i would love to open up um you know open up the space for you know in the in the guides divine intelligence for an attunement or any other transmission or message that could mm -hmm. serve the people listening to this uh to this show here All right, let me see let me just step out address several yeah. things. They're saying we would like to address several things. First and foremost is identity. First and foremost is identity or belief or the belief that you are separate. The aspect of you who knows it is. The aspect of you who knows who it is, knows itself and knows itself in union always. And so always and so will always, will always be in union, in union or consciousness. You don't conjure this, you align to it, you align to it. The attunements we offer, the attunements we offer, reclaim you, reclaim you at a level of tone, at a level of tone, each and every one, each and every one to align to you, to align you to your highest, to your highest expression, expression, underline the word expression, underline the word expression. It's how you demonstrate. It is how you demonstrate or facilitate or facilitate the monad, the monad come as you, come as you, or the divine come as you, or the divine come as you, its expression, its expression is what is being claimed here, is what is being claimed here, not the better idea of you, not the better idea of you, or the more beneficial one, or the more beneficial one, the true one, the true one, the aspect of you that truly knows, the aspect of you that truly knows. You may say these words after we speak them if you wish. You may say these words after we speak them if you wish. I know who I am in truth. I know who I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth. I know how I serve in truth. I am free. 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 I am in the upper room. I am in the upper room. I have come. I have come. I have come. I have come. I have come, I have come. Behold, I make all things new. <laughs> Behold, I make all things new. It will be so. It will be so. 
God is, God is, God is. God is, God is, God is. The experience of the teachings culminating in God is, which is expression, which is expression, can now be understood, can now be understood as aligning to, is aligning to what is always true. You don't make God God. You don't make God God. You align to the source of all things. You align to the source of all things. Come as all things. Come as all things. You must understand. You must understand that the source of all things is present. That the source of all things is present in Atman. And that the denial of the divine, which is the disfiguring reality, which is the disfiguring of reality through the lens of separation, through the lens of separation can be reclaimed, can be reclaimed. The attunements align your source. The attunements align you to source and in benefit ways and in beneficial ways. The truth of your being, the truth of your being that indeed has come, that indeed has come, will support the reclamation, will support the reclamation of the manifest world, of the manifest world. The God's claim, that is the claim. Behold, I make all things new. It will be so. It will be so. The activation of the prior claim, the activation of the prior claim come into form come into form as all things, as all things. And that is the final claim. And that is the final claim. God is, God is, God is, God is, God is, God is. Mm. Hmm. I could feel a, a beautiful lifting from that, uh, from that transmission. And it also points to a practicum. And the practicum yeah. is to use that, you know, and there's many of them that come in all of the teachings mm -hmm. in your books, yeah. but that particular one seems to be, it seems to have built over the years in the many books, these 11 books, and it's now culminating in that particular sequence. And it's of yeah. all of the attunements, it's the, it's the most powerful because it's the, mm -hmm. it's taken, it's gone the farthest Yeah. and not to try and rank the attunements, but, but ultimately it was, it was just a beautiful experience for me to experience that and, and feel that in my own body and just remind myself if I find myself, you know, uh, rummaging around in the basement mm -hmm. whether, and then just in a desire through my own will and choice to start to elevate myself, to use something like those attunements to mm -hmm. bring myself back into the acknowledgement of who I really am. Yeah. They're there. You know, the guides describe them at different times as like notes on a piano. And when all the notes are played in unison, you have a chord. And to be in a chord, or ACCORD, they say, or ACHORD, is to move into the level of alignment of the claim. Mm -hmm. And this seems to culminate in the claim God is. And I think they've taken us through them in sequence because we can only hold so much at right. a certain time. You bring too much light into a room where somebody's been sitting in the dark, they're going to run or they'll blow their fuses. You know, too much electricity in the bulb, you go bang. <laughs> right, but I right, think right. we're being prepared for this in gradation. And the attunements people can work with on their own as they wish. It's there. They say it's yeah. language encoded with vibration. It's always there. Yeah. Paul, I love you, man. Love you I really too. do. Yeah, you've been a great friend and ally um, for me, for those that I love, and of course for the world. And uh, it's just uh, always a delight and pleasure to see your face. And, uh, and hopefully we'll get to see each other in person uh, again at some point uh, along the path. I'm sure we will. And, um, and I look forward to these books keep coming. So I look forward, I look forward to getting my advanced copy of the next one as well, because yeah. I'm, I'm right there riding along with the teachings and, uh, and, you know, charting my own path of, of how I'm able to align with them in the, in the best way possible. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you so much to everybody tuning in. The book is The Book of Innocence, and it will be available everywhere books are sold. And I highly recommend the audiobook version too, because when Paul's reading it, it's particularly powerful. He also doesn't, he, he just reads the, the, the text. He doesn't actually have to whisper and repeat. Yeah. So it's a very smooth process in the audiobooks. So highly recommend the audiobooks. They're fantastic. Yeah. All right. So much love, Paul. So much love, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.